The following video is part of my Data Center Interconnects webinar. To learn more about my webinars, please visit my website. Layer 2 Data Center Interconnect is bridging between data centers. And some people sort of confuse this with just using a bridged service to connect to data centers. If you're using VPLS from the service provider and you put your routers to it, and then you route or run MPLS VPN between your data centers. This is not layer two interconnect. Layer two interconnect is really a VLAN extension. So if you have the same IP subnet in two data centers, then we are talking about layer two interconnect. Those of you that read my blog know that I am extremely opposed to this idea. And uh, whenever I'm provoking people to tell me what the reason is to use layer 2 DCI, these are the four things that come to their mind. FCOE between data centers, workload migration, either for, double quotes, business agility or for disaster avoidance. Follow the sun to reduce latency or stretched clusters. Now let's bust some of these myths. First one is very easy. By the way, I got this one from the presentation that someone from Cisco was giving when Cisco was launching Fabric Path. Now, Fabric Path is a good idea if you need that. However, you don't need bridging or Fabric Path to run FCOE. Because the way Cisco implements FCOE is what I call unofficially dense mode FCOE, where every single box is actually a fiber channel forwarder, which in traditional IP terminology would mean it's a router. If every single switch in the path is a router, obviously you don't need bridging. You need VLANs on inter-switch links because you have to assign FCOE traffic to a VLAN, but that VLAN is just between two adjacent switches. And FCOE between data centers works only if you have dark fiber, because all other technologies are not lossless. So if you have dark fiber or maybe SDH, then we can start discussing about FCOE between data centers. Otherwise, you cannot make the link lossless. And so it doesn't make sense to even start considering FCOE. The other problem are distance limitations. Because of the flow control mechanism used by FCOE, actually it uses one of the IEEE 802.1 standards, the switches connected to the long distance link need pretty large buffers. And initially the maximum distance was a few hundred meters. Now with new Nexus models and new software and new line cards, this has been extended to a few kilometers, but it's still way lower than what you can do with traditional fiber channel with synchronous replication. So check your distances, check with uh, Cisco what the actual current figures for the current switch and the current line card you're using are. Interdata center FCOE where limited use and requires no bridging. Myth number one, busted. Myth number two, follow the sun. This one is really great. So we have this mission critical application and it really can't tolerate latency very well. So the idea is that we will move it around the data centers around the world so that it will always be close to the users. I have nothing against that if you use multiple instances of the same application and geo load balancing like with GSS. However, the idea of moving live running virtual machine between data centers is plain stupid. The problem is that the maximum route trip time supported by VMware for vMotion was 5 milliseconds. Now it's 10 milliseconds, but you need vSphere 5 and the enterprise edition of uh, vSphere. Still, 10 milliseconds can get you across a country it can hardly get you to Ireland. It will never get you across the Atlantic or Pacific. So follow the sun, workload migration is a plain stupid idea.
Myth number two busted. Next, workload migration for disaster avoidance. This one is explained this way. Imagine that you have a data center that you have to shut down. Like you have a flood coming in or you have a total power loss and you are on batteries, the generator didn't start, you have a panic situation, you need to evacuate the data center. Usually, normal people would do this by shutting down the virtual machines in one data center, restarting them in the other data center and continuing their business. Supposedly, some mission critical applications cannot survive that. So the idea is to migrate them live between data centers. Well, the first question one should ask himself is, if an application is so critical, how comes it cannot run in more than one instance? How do they handle server patches? How do they handle application crashes? How do they handle all other things that could go wrong with any software? Shutting down a data center is, is a disaster that happens once every few years. Server patches are a disaster that happens once every few months. How do they handle that? The other reality check is the cost of doing this. Even if you would have a totally empty one gig link between the data centers, and you know that the links between data centers are never empty, this would cost you in US something like $10,000 a month. In Europe, the prices are probably around that number as well. Depends on whether you have dark fiber or you really have to pay for the bandwidth. But let's assume a round number, totally empty one gig link that you use for nothing else than disaster avoidance. Because if this link is loaded, then you will not be able to use it when it matters. So you have to have that bandwidth reserved. Over that link, you can move something like three to 400 gig per hour. Now this is optimistic. This does not include the overhead of vMotion. This does not include all the changed copies that you have to repeat, repeatedly transfer between the two data centers. The way vMotion works is it starts copying the memory of a virtual machine to the other side. And of course the virtual machine is running in between. So it constantly changes the memory and vMotion tries to keep up by copying all the changes. So you always have to copy more than the size of your VM because the VM has changed in the meantime. Anyway, with an empty one gig link, you can copy half of a single UCS chassis, which is half of a third of one rack per hour. So when someone asks you for this function, ask them how many virtual machines they want to copy and how, long, how much time they have on their hands. And they'll probably say, well, we, we, we need to copy these 30 virtual machines and one of them is SQL Server, which needs 100 gig of RAM and we have half an hour. Now you do the math. And then you figure out how much you need to spend per month just to have this ability. And then you do some financial math and you compute net present value of the cost of this extra bandwidth. So you're paying this extra for foreseeable future, just so that once you might have it when you need it. If you do this with $10,000 per month, it's something like $1.2 million when you calculate it back to net present value. So you go with these figures to whoever is requesting this and ask for the budget. Probably you have solved your problem. This is the comment I got just this morning from a worry senior guy working for one of the vendors. If you Google on his name, you'll find exactly where he's working. I didn't want to put that into the presentation. And this is what he said. You see, vMotion is so cool that you have some rough expectation management issues. People just don't understand that doing long distance vMotion is not simple because it's so cool. It looks so simple. And the truth is that for most customers, it's acceptable 
to stop the VM in one place and start it in another place. And so by accepting a few minute downtime that happens in a panic situation once every few years reduces the complexity of your data center and increases the supported distance because if you run on layer three, you know that the distance is unlimited. Myth number three, busted. The last one that I sometimes stumble across are stretched clusters. So the idea is I have some high availability cluster, be it Windows Server failover cluster or VMware vSphere cluster, and multiple servers are offering the same service, but the service is only running on one of the servers. And when the service fails or the server fails and we detect this failure through whatever mechanism, the service is automatically restarted on another server. That's great. Now, the first thing people forget is that I said restart it, which means that when a service fails, you have to start it from scratch. When a virtual machine fails, VMware high availability starts it from scratch. So there's your downtime. However, some people think that stretched clusters in two data centers are a good idea. So you would have members of the same cluster in two different data centers. And usually this translates into layer two connectivity. Now, interestingly, layer two connectivity is not actually a requirement. If you're really smart, you could make this work even with VMware ESX cluster without layer two connectivity. You would just have to rely on DHCP on a number of other mechanisms. Windows Server Failover Cluster in the latest release supports layer three connectivity. What they do is they register the service using a domain name, like it should always have been done. Even Microsoft has realized that layer two data center interconnect is a bad idea, and they offer you a server clustering solution that works over layer three. Anyway, imagine that someone actually goes and implements this. This is a typical way to implement this. You would have a public interface on every server and an interconnect interface, which is between the servers. And you need some distributed storage that is synchronized between the two data centers. And you usually need layer two interconnect so that when a service fails in one machine and it is restarted on another machine, it can still use the same IP address. Of course, you have some unpredictable or suboptimal traffic flows and another of other problems. The other problem is that you have actually made a single failure domain out of two totally separate, well-working data centers. Because if you lose the link in the middle, you will lose at least half of the cluster. So the things that would usually operate independently are now gone. And if you really mess it up, you could get a split brain problem. So two data centers that could work independently have just become a single failure domain. And whoever tells me that the link in the middle will never fail, or that if the link fails, we'll have other more pressing problems than this, hasn't been working in networking long enough. The link in the middle fails. And because of the way the cluster works, half of the nodes have to figure out that they are isolated and they shut down. VMware does this a little bit better in vSphere 5 but assumes that you get at least distributed storage still up and running. So half of the nodes lose the quorum, which is the mechanism how a node in the cluster realizes it's isolated and they shut down, which means that perfectly well running services have to be restarted on the other side just because you lost the data center interconnect link. And because you have a single subnet on both ends, all the external routing will probably stop working as well. An even better situation is if the storage splits and both parts of storage become active and allow the machines to write to the storage. Then you get two unsynchronized copies of the storage 
it's impossible to synchronize them again. But of course, when the link comes back up, the storage will try to do its best, and you usually end up with totally corrupt data. I've seen it happen once with a database running in a cluster environment, and the poor guys needed something like a day to recover the data from tape backup. Not to mention that they lost a whole day worth of transactions. So split brain, if it happens, and it will eventually happen in a stretch cluster, is a total disaster. Myth number four, I would say, bust it. So what's left? You still want it? No problem, let's go into details how you can implement it for the customers. To get more information about my webinars, to register for an online session, buy a recording or a yearly subscription, please visit my website.